So uh, the goal of today, the two classes of today, one by me and the other by Dario Bonino later, uh, will be to start uh, uh, learning uh, how to use the web technologies that we learned uh, for interface design, user interfaces. Up to now, we just saw how to create very, very simple websites uh, where the client uh, was actually a human navigating through web pages. Well, we want to use the same technologies uh, for, uh, as, a, as a tool uh, for integrating so distributed software. So in, uh, in our project, uh, we will have uh, some software running on a mobile, some running on a browser, some running on a server, and they will need to communicate with some maybe gateway that is able to control some home uh, equipment. And so all these nodes can make a distributed architecture and they need to communicate with each other. So today we'll see what is the most used, uh, the most frequently used today method for integrating these components and for designing their communication, okay? So, f and all of these will be according to web technologies, so it will rely on HTTP. So let me first spend a, a few words of more detail about the HTTP protocol mm. that we already saw. We already have an idea what HTTP does with the request and response, uh, but now we need uh, a bit more detail for understanding how to use or exploit uh, HTTP for doing something more than what it, than what it intended, was intended for. Hmm? Okay, we already know that uh, HTTP is a simple protocol that was designed uh, for uh, delivering web pages, for requesting and delivering the web pages. Uh, it's nothing special, if you want, uh, you can go uh, to the IETF uh, website and, and read the definition of HTTP. You know, it's a long read, but, uh, but not terribly long, uh, I would say. And so, uh, maybe, so, if you are used to have a look at uh, network protocols, uh, it's quite easy uh, to grasp, actually. Hmm? But we, we don't need uh, just to, to read uh, but, uh, at the specification, even if in some corner cases it would be useful to go and look. Uh, what we <clears throat> just uh, need to remember is this uh, exchange of messages. So usually HTTP relies on messages, and messages may be request messages or response messages, just to make the terminology clear. And all messages share the same format. We have to look at them by browsing. There is a, a starting line, initial line, some headers, one or more, or zero or more headers, possibly a blank line, and possibly, optionally, a message body. And this is the format of all the messages, both for requests and for, um, for responses. Of course, the meaning and the content of the first line and the meaning of the con and the content of the headers lines are different from request to response. But the format is always the same. Uh, well, we already saw example like this. We have the first line, one header line, and nobody. So we don't even need the, the blank line. In this case, we have the, the first line, some headers, and then would be, uh, this is a 200 reply, so there will be a blank line at the end the HTML content to follow. Um, let's go into a bit more detail about the syntax of these messages. In the request, the initial line has always three fields. The first is the command, the method the method that we want to use uh, in this specific request. And we have, uh, today we will have a lot to say about method, okay? And then the path to the file or to the resource in general that we are requesting or we are addressing with this request. Uh, if the method is get, of course we are requesting this resource. But if the method is not get, it's something different, we are more in general addressing some resource to read it, to write it, to modify it, that's it. And then the protocol version. Um, the, we already know that from the, our uh, the games in Flask uh, that uh, the 
name of a path uh, doesn't need to correspond. Uh, it just, uh, when we define the roots for the web page, it's just uh, pattern matching. We define a string that makes sense, hmm, that is uh, sensible in a way, uh, and then we will map that to some executing code. Hmm? They look like, like files into folders, but actually they are not hmm, in reality. Okay. Um, I said about methods. So the most used method uh, used for, say, most of the navigation we do on the, on the web is get. Get is a request for having a response head and body corresponding to the resource. So reading a resource with header and with a real, a real body. There's also a simplified version of get, which is called head. Head is interpreted in the same way as get, but the response of head is just made of the headers. So imagine the headers and then a blank line and then the body, just delete the body and the blank line. What remains is the head. So sometimes you just need to know whether the resource is still there, whether the web server is still alive, or you want to refresh the session, okay? So, uh, so tell the server that you are still there, you are still making requests. So the lightest way of doing that is making a head request to a page. The server just has to reply with, a, with, an, with an empty body and with the minimal uh, headers, of course. Then we have uh, the post. We already encountered the post method when sending a form data. And usually post is used uh, to submit a set of structured data, data with a structure, a, li a list of variables, each with a name and a value, from the client to the server. Usually, when the client is a browser, the data comes from the user through an HTML form. But the HTTP protocol doesn't know where the, where the data is taken, uh, is taken from. But usually post, you see that you use something that is used to write some data in a way. I'm sending you some data for the server to act, to do something. Hmm? So you, we, we may start associating get with the reading and put, uh, sorry, post with writing or updating. Hmm? Uh, then we are more specified, uh, more specific uh, verbs or methods. For example, put is used for uploading resources. So when you are uploading a file, you may use the put method for uh, creating the first version of a new resource being applied. Delete uh, is used to, do, to delete, as the verb knows, uh, something that is already existing. These two, put and delete, don't make much sense in web navigation. They are defined in HTTP for allowing the software interoperability. They are not used by browsers, by web browsers. With a web browser, you cannot delete a web page or something like some content in a remote server. Okay? Um, and uh, a little more. Hmm? But this, the, the last four ones are not uh, interesting to us because they ma are mainly for protocol debugging or, or, or tweaking uh, or, uh, or in creating an encrypted tunnel over a connection. But they don't do anything at the application level. So, um, well, okay, the request version is uh, always this. We have these uh, different verbs. Let's take them, or methods, let's, them, let's take, take them in mind, and keep them in mind for the next section, for the next topic. Uh, the response is a simpler structure, in, in a sense. The first line is just a protocol version and a numeric code and a textual code. The same information is represented twice, once in, a, uh, in number form and the other in, English, in the English form. And uh, uh, the HTTP response codes are grouped uh, into these five groups. According, they are all three-digit three digit codes. And the first digit may be one through five. And the one is just an information. 
if you are requesting from some information, for example, with the head, probably they, it will give you some one code. If the request is successful, so you requested something to read or to write something, then the server will reply positively that your request was honored correctly, code two. Code three means, uh, okay, the request may be, can be satisfied, but the resource name has to be changed. This happens when you redirect a website to another, or you move pages around, and your client still makes the request with the old addresses because there's some link that has not been updated or something like that. In that case, the server tells, okay, try again, but try again with this address. And the browser will need to process the response and repeat the request. And the four and five groups are for errors. So uh, requests that cannot be honored right now. And uh, the four codes are the client's fault. The request made by the client uh, was not correct. Maybe the URL was wrong, there was a typo, a mistake, or the syntax of the headers was wrong. Or the server's fault. So the, the request was correct, but the server was not able to complete it. Maybe the server relied on some information that had to be stored in a database, and that database currently is not accessible, is, is down, or, or it has a problem. Or there's some exception in our code, some error in our code, and so the request was correct, but the server was, was not able to process and complete it. These are the five groups that match to more specific codes. So every group uh, is uh, actually a list uh, of specific codes. The most, uh, uh, say, frequent one that we see is 200 OK, or 301 moved, so the redirection, or 404 page not found. And we may have uh, 500 internal server error so for any, any general error message. This is what the server tells us in the first line of the re response. And then we have a lot of uh, header lines, uh, one per line, uh, with the format name, column, value. And uh, uh, the request headers and the response headers are different, of course. So here I just have a list uh, of the headers that may, should be or may be in the request, only one is mandatory, host. All the others are optional. And then a set of headers for, that may appear in the response. We, we don't need to, to study all of them. If you want to know what they do, you can go and read the specification. There it's quite clear. And there are also some headers that uh, are general in the sense that it may be used both in the request and the response. Hmm? But today we don't need to, to enter into these details. And then we have the body of the message. Usually we tend to, uh, say, associate the body with the response, because responses most often have a body to carry, carry a body back, hmm? carry a document back to the, to the client. But uh, uh, the body may also be associated to the request, especially for put and post, where we are sending something, and this object that we are sending will be put into the request body. So we have a, a body for the request and also a body for the re, uh, response. Um, and whenever we are trans transporting some content over a text protocol, HTTP is a text-based protocol, everything is in plain text lines, we need to specify what is the format of the body, both in the request and in the response. And so there is one specific header for the content type, so the type of the content of the body being sent or being received. So these are just some examples. Usually, the content type of, for the responses are text slash HTML. 
So in most of the responses from web servers, we have a header saying content type is text slash HTML and correspond to HTML5. But we may also have an image back. And so in this case, uh, the content type will be image slash PNG, and this will instruct the browser to interpret the body of the response uh, by decoding a PNG image instead of by parsing an HTML file. Mm -hmm. So what, say, uh, defines and characterizes the processing made by the browser of a resource is the content type, not the file name. Mm -hmm. Usually browsers should not look at file names, only at content types, except for Internet Explorer that does something different. There are also some uh, application slash prefixes for uh, file formats that are not standard or vendor specific. This VND stands for vendor. So a uh, format defined by a specific vendor and it's an application format is not a generic, say, file format uh, interoperable or standardized in some way. Uh, okay, uh, for better declaring the content of the body, there are some specific headers that, for example, declare the length of the document, uh, uh, its uh, um, hash signature, so that if the content is long, we can check, or the browser can check easily whether the content was valid or was corrupt or corrupted. Uh, the encoding for text uh, messages, whether the encoding is the ANSI, is Unicode, is uh, another character set for international characters, and so on. Uh, in HTTP, there is also a chapter about authentication. So um, how the server checks the identity of the client. There are different ways uh, uh, we discuss them because they are practically never used. The authentication at the HTTP level is too basic, it's too simple. Well, there is one level which is totally insecure. The basic authentication just sends the password and username on the request. So uh, very easy to intercept. That is the authentication is harder, but then we don't have any mechanism for changing the authentication credential on the way. So you could do a login, but not a logout, or can, you cannot change your identity alongside. So there is not, it's not flexible enough for, for our needs. So what happens today is that most HTTP requests just go through without any authentication. And if we need to do some kind of authentication, so recognizing the user and authorizing the user to do something, we do it at the application level. So we don't rely on the HTTP authentication. We build our own authentication mechanism, login, password, and so on, at the application level, with application code. So that's why. It's there, but it's rarely used. Okay, uh, about the method, we already talked about head. Uh, the issue about post is that there's uh, the post request always has a body, and this body is a set, is a set of, represents a set, a set of data or a message or a content. So usually, this is one the more specific case in which the request uh, URL or URI is not a page, but is a resource, a page, a, a, software, um, a method, a software procedure that uh, knows what to do with the data. Hmm? Um, so in normal, let's say, navigation of the website, in many cases, you can choose between get and post whenever you want to send some parameter. For example, the HTML forms uh, can have a method equal get or method equal post attribute. When you create a form, you can decide. Uh, the most visible difference is that uh, with the get method, uh, all the information about uh, the, the data being sent is encoded uh, in the URL itself. With post, it's not visible because it's encoded in the body of the request. Well, this is just uh, a convenience difference. Uh, if we look at the, or read or study the, the definition of these methods, uh, there's a 
strange word that comes out and say that usually you should design requests so that get requests are idempotent, idempotent. So uh, idempotent is uh, with the same power means. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if I, uh, I should expect a web server to reply with the same information whether I do one get or two or three or five or, or 10 gets to the same information. So doing, the idea is doing a get should not change the state of the server. A get is for getting information that is already there without changing that information as an effect of the get. So get is good if my form is a sort of a search form. I put the search criteria and I send the form. So the result, if I repeat the request one second after, I will get the same result. If I am sending some data, inserting a new user, the data of the new user, name, first name, last name, address, and so on, then that should be a post. Because this, this set of data will change the state of the system. Because after that, there will be another user. And probably if I try to resend that, that same information one second after, it will fail. It will either create a duplicate user, user or more likely, it will, re, it will, it will reject no, the, the request because the user is already present, so you cannot create twice the same user with the same username and so on. And also the browser knows that. When you navigate a website and you have encountered that, when you go back and forward with the, with the, with the arrows, whenever the uh, browser, you go back and you request, uh, you navigate in a page that had a get method, the browser just requests the page again with no trouble. The browser assumes that it's uh, safe, now, it's not dangerous to redo the request. On the other hand, when you step back and you find a page that was sent using a post, the browser will ask you, do you want to resend the data again? Because the browser knows that potentially a post request may have side effects. Okay, so it, it's up to you. It's a very bad thing to, to, to say, to put this choice or to, the, this question to the final user who don't understand the difference. Why on some pages I get this, this question and not in some others? But it's actually all the consequence or the expectations that we have when we make a get, it's always safe to repeat it. When I get a post, once it's done, it should, need, it should not be repeated because it could create double information or, um, or errors. So why do we do this discussion now? Because we are, HTTP is no, it's not only or no longer just for forms, for sending data, for creating information. Uh, right now we will use it also for integrating different uh, uh, applications. So it's a sort of a high level, we will use it as a sort of a high level transport mechanism. I want to send some information from one application to another, but the easiest way today, nowadays, is to pack this information into an HTTP request and deploy a small web server on the other side, able to get this information to process this request. There are many other ways of sending or sending information between two different machines. You could open a socket, you could uh, send them a, a message with some sort of middleware, but they all tend to be more complex and more specific about operating systems, versions, languages, and so on, with respect to HTTP, which is very easy to deploy and very easy to program. And also, another big advantage of HTTP is that all the firewalls, all the proxies are already open for HTTP. So you are using a protocol that already is, is not block, blocked by your network infrastructure. If you wanted to, to use a different protocol, then you would have to check that all the firewalls and routers in, in, in between won't block that uh, other port while you are sure that port 80 it will, be, it will always be open because people need it for, for browsing. 
So the, 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 um, the end point of this consideration is uh, that people started to find ways of letting different applications to exchange data and then information by sending commands over HTTP, commands or information requests over HTTP. So if I'm deploying, uh, I don't know, a, um, an IP camera in my house no, for monitoring what's, what's happening, for having a video flow of what's happening, well, mm, all the cameras available today have built in a small web server, and they can send HTTP commands to the camera to say, take a snapshot, switch on, switch off, move, or whatever. They accept commands in this way. And uh, we say uh, people started to define a sort of guidelines uh, of rules on how it's best to uh, encode programming requests uh, with HTTP. And what they came out uh, was with an uh, arch architectural style that is called REST. Hmm? REST is a nice word, it's short, it's easy to pronounce, easy to write. It has a very strange name, representational state transfer. I, not easy to decode, it looks like a, a train from state to state or something like that. But uh, uh, actually, is a, a, set, a set of represents a set of conventions uh, for integrating distributed systems. And by distributed, we mean software running on different nodes, on different computers, independently of the of the platform. Communicate with the PC, communicate with the Raspberry, communicate with uh, some embedded system with an Android application or whatever, independently from the language, because it's all on top of HTTP, and HTTP has already all this independence built in. And the person who developed the REST, or published the REST proposal, was this Roy Fielding, which is one of the bosses of the web, was the person that started the Apache server, so he knows about HTTP, you can bet it. And um, so what we are trying to describe now is uh, how one node, one application, models its information and models its uh, actions, its comments to the external world so that others can interact with it. And uh, the idea is that uh, we, we need to think of our applications as uh, nodes that manage resources. So in my, for example, uh, wake up uh, system, in the example that we used, uh, a resource uh, may be a wake up call. So the system is able to manage different uh, wake up calls. A resource may be a ringing tone. I have different ringing tones, uh, let's say, available. A resource may be a device. You know, the wake up alarm can ring on many different devices. A resource can be a user. So all the entities, the high level entities that your system is managing are called the resources. Can be documents, can be information, pieces of information, can be services, can be reference about other objects and so on. So we try to describe the uh, objects that we care about in terms of generic resources. And usually I'm talking plural objects and resources, because the system is able to manage many users, many wake up times, many uh, ring tones, and so on. So we will have lists of such resources. And uh, we do one design step by saying, OK, a resource represents one object of a given type. So every resource will have some 
attributes, some specific information about that. We call the specific information about the resource, we call it the representation. Okay, but maybe the list of attributes, uh, the wake up time is uh, as a representation as hour, minute, second, and maybe the days of the week in which the information about the specific object. And every resource uh, will be mapped uh, to a specific URI. So we map all the resources that we have, the manager, of the different types, to specific URIs, addresses. So one address will represent one resource. Hmm? Quite natural. We are trying to map everything into the small ingredients that we have in HTTP. And basically in HTTP we have two ingredients, the methods and the URIs. And so uh, we identify the resource with the URI and we identify the action that we want to do with the resource with a method from HTTP. So I, if I want to have the list of available uh, ringtones, for example, I can do a get slash ringtones. So the ringtones, plural, is the list of all the possible ringtones. If I get this resource, what I expect to have is a list of the actual resources of type ringtone. And this list may be one, two, three, four, five, imagine the music player. And then I can select the second one. So I can do something like get slash ringtones slash two number two, or the ID of the second one. And that will get me, so will give me information, technically, will give me the representation of the information about ringtone number two. Okay, so we map everything into resources, and resources may be objects or lists of objects. We construct URIs to represent lists, we construct URIs to represent objects, and we exchange information about these objects, all in a uniform way. So usually we have two types of resources, collections or lists, and individual elements, objects. The format that we choose, right now we are into the conventions realm, okay? So we decide to do this. There's no rule, there's no law, there's no standard. It's just a good practice. When we want to represent a list, we use a, a URI, the URI of our server in which the application is running, slash the name of the type of resource in the plural form, students. This would be, would supposedly, it doesn't exist, but would give me the list of all the students. And this will be, give me the list of all the courses. <coughs> all or a subset or whatever. But would represent this resource. What can I do to this resource? I can read it, give me a list, I can modify it. What does it mean to modify a list? Well, it may mean adding one element. I can add a new course by writing into this resource. If I think about a collection, a list of objects, there are only basically two meaningful operations. Give me the list of the items contained or add one item. These operations affect the list. Other operations tend to affect individual resources, single items inside the list. And how do we represent the URI, the URI of single items inside the list? With the name of the list slash identificator of the resource, the ID of a resource, primary key, the sequence number, the course code, or whatever. So this would represent a student from the set of students, an individual resource. And if I try to read this, I expect to have all the properties of that specific student. And if I write this, I expect to change the properties of that student. 
or the other operation I can do, reading, changing, or deleting a student. Creating a student is not an operation we do on students, it's an operation we do on the collection, adding one item. Reading, modifying, or deleting is something that we do on the specific student, on that student resource. That is destroyed. Huh? It may take it personally, but it's that resource that gets re destroyed. So everything we should try to represent to think when you're designing you know, your architecture, think about your nodes or what kind of services I can offer to the external side world, to the outside world. So these re action, these resources, these methods should be represented or rewritten or rethought. Re huh? Try to think them in terms of resources, that is, in terms of collections and items inside collections. There's another ingredient, which are, uh, sorry, what is that? Okay, so <laughs> it was not in the order I expected. There are a third ingredient uh, in our representation that are relationships. I have the list of courses, I have the list of students. How do I represent uh, that the student is enrolled in a course? So in this case, I can use this uh, three-level representation. Students, the collection of all the students, student ID, and then a collection about uh, a relationship uh, of uh, that student with the list of courses. So the subset of the collection courses that is relevant to that student. So when we represent collection, we, that, we just need the first part of, of the address. When we represent items, we need the collection part and the ID part. When we rep represent a relationship, we need three parts. The collection, the element, and the relationship type. So if I read this resource, I expect to have the list of courses of that student. If I write this resource, I expect to add one course to the courses of that user. If I delete an item, that would be another level, and so on. So we map everything like this. We try to simplify everything like this. So do you, uh, we, you can imagine having many methods in your application that you want to export and you want to offer. Actually, with this kind of REST architecture, we are forcing all methods with this syntax. One parameter method for collection, two parameter methods for uh, items, three parameter methods for um, relationships, and that's all. And what do we do with these names, with these resources? Uh, well, just one hint, uh, these names should be as concrete as possible, okay? So always try to use the most specific name about a resource just for readability. And what can we do on these items? Well, we can use the HTTP verbs methods onto this resource. So get means retrieving the representation of the resource. And if the resource is a collection, it will give me a representation of the list of objects. Maybe just the IDs or maybe some small information about each of them, not full information about, about everybody. And if I get one individual element, it will give me all or most of the properties of that element. If I'm doing a post, well, you use it usually to create, to send new information. Usually it's used for a collection. I post a new item into a collection. And put is usually used for updating existing elements, mainly for items, not for collections. This distinction is a bit fuzzy. You know, this is no standard, there's no rule. These are just guidelines, so different developers may have different, uh, say, options. but. Uh, more or less the idea is that we know that we want to change, uh, changing a collection means undid something, changing an item means uh, modifying its properties. The suggestion is to use post for creating new items into collections, 
put for modifying items inside the collection, individual items. And delete, of course, with items. It's very unlikely that my application will accept a delete on a collection. That would mean delete every item in the collection, hmm. very unlikely to be a useful comment that we want to expose to, it, to the external world. So let's combine them. We have resources, collections of type collections or resources of type uh, item. And we may apply the different methods of HTTP to this. And we have all the possible cases. We post into a collection, creating a new dog, but the representation about a new dog. Posting into an item is usually an error. Uh, get dogs, give me the list of all the dogs. Get dog one, two, three, four, give me all the information about that specific dog called Bo. Put onto an item, well, this item, Bo, should already exist, and so I can update its uh, information. If it doesn't exist, it's an error. So it's an error to refer to a resource that doesn't exist already. If I want to create it, I need first to post it into the collection, and then I can update the item with put. Sometimes put on a collection is used to replace the whole connection collection with a new one. Hmm? Block update. So we, I send you a, a, block, a block of dogs and update all of them at the, at the same time. The delete on single item will delete the item and a delete at the collection level will the delete all the elements. So this is just a way of representing the information and the actions, so I, I, we can map both uh, information requests, uh, basically in the get command, and the possible the valid information updates or comments that can be sent to a resource. So try to imagine your, your application, what kind of services it has to offer, what kind of information it makes available, what kind of comments uh, it may accept, and try to put them into this grid mentally. If you do that, then it will be much easier to implement your interface, both on the caller side, because the callers then will use this convention and know what to do, and we don't need actually to learn the names of your methods and the parameter type of the 17th argument of uh, the API version 27, but they just need to understand what are, what are the resources that you offer, and all the rest is uh, implicit here. So in my case, uh, I would have a sort of a slash uh, um, wait times. And I, when I want to set a new wait time, I uh, would have just to post slash wait times with the, with the it's a post, so the, body, the request is a body. And in the body of the request, I would have all the information about the new wait time, the hour and the days of week in which it is valid. So we try to. At the high level, see that. Of course, uh, representation. There's one information that is missing is uh, the encoding of the body. How do I encode information about uh, the dogs out or about the wake times? Well, I may choose. May, I may have a, a text format, or may have an XML format. Or nowadays, it's more likely to have a JSON format. We'll see some, some JSON syntax later. But it's a very simple text format with uh, brackets uh, and uh, embraces, so curly braces and square brackets to delimit uh, uh, objects and, uh, and lists. It's, it's a similar that is taken from JavaScript. It's quite in some way similar to uh, Python dictionaries as a syntax. It's a way, uh, a simple textual way of representing nested objects, or even complex objects, without all the verbosity of, a, of XML. In XML, you have tags, you have to match them, you have to define a data type, and so on. 
So nowadays, usually, the, the format in which data is exchanged, both in the request, if I'm doing a post, I send you the data of the wait time, or in a, um, responses, is in most of the cases this JSON format. Hmm? JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, so a way of describing objects in JavaScript. But it's so simple that it's not actually tied to JavaScript. It may be used by any language, and Python is no exception. So usually, uh, the format is specified by an accept header by saying, telling to the server, well, you can give me the response in this format, and the, the header will set a content type of uh, application request JSON. Or in some cases, the format may be forced with a JSON extension, which is not part of the request, actually. Just an instruction telling, well, please give me the, the answer in this format, or with a specific query parameter like this. These are just needed. Uh, if my application is able, or if I want to build my application so that it can reply in different formats. There are websites that can give you the reply both in XML or in JSON at your request, depends on what you want. Okay, real life. In real life, uh, I just picked up four of the very famous sites, websites to uh, have a look at what they do. So if you go to these websites, you see that all of them, the popular ones, already offer an interface for um, manipulating the information, which follows more or less no, this uh, pattern. For example, uh, you may know Flickr, the photo the sharing site. And if you go to this address, when the network is working. Yes. That the documentation about their API. It's loading. But it's not the only one. While this one is, lo lo is loading, I will check another one. Another very famous one is Twitter. <laughs> what I mean is that all these people found useful to offer an API based on the same ideas, on the same architecture. So once we get the ideas, we can very easily interact with all of these services. And uh, the next one is uh, Google Calendar, for example. And the next one they thought is uh, Facebook. So besides all the user interactive services, these websites uh, always also offer an interface for application. So the user, the clients may be a browser with the user playing or programs that send commands to them. For example, uh, let's start from a API, uh, to, sorry, Twitter is, is easier to understand. You see that uh, uh, on, on the left, uh, you have this public API, and we tell you the command that this API accepts. For example, if you want to search tweets, uh, there's a get search tweets. So in, the, in this case, the resource is tweets uh, with a search, search before that. And you just have to send a, a command to this, uh, in this case it's a get, uh, to this address uh, with uh, a set of possible optional parameters. You can see, for example, the direct messages to you, you know, tweet, in your Twitter you can send a message to one person. This is the URL that you need to get. And uh, the response will be in JSON, and these are the, the parameters. You can uh, uh, see all the latest statuses. Statuses are, is the, say, is the API term, but the public term is tweets. 
Uh, if you get all the tweets, uh, you can uh, query this address uh, with some query parameters and so on. And this for, sorry, the, I, I clicked on the, on the wrong one. These are your last tweets. The, the one before that I, one that I click that I click before is a post uh, status is update. So send a new tweet. Actually, this means post an update to your status. You see that is not really conforming to the definition that we, I, I, I said before, because the resource will be statuses. So this update uh, has no meaning, actually is useless. Huh? But uh, so the syntax of the API doesn't really always match no, with the general guidelines. But, uh, and the nice part of the, for example, for Twitter and for many other sites is that you, there's also an interactive way of testing. For example, there's this uh, console tool in which you can interactively test different uh, comments. So with this, uh, any application that you have that is able to send HTTP requests can interact with Twitter for doing anything, for doing all the things that you already can do interactively. The same is uh, for Facebook, for example. Uh -huh. the REST API in Facebook is called Graph API. This is what they call it. And uh, I have the, uh, they have all the, again, reference. This network is not. And you have the, the resources, they call them root nodes. All the applications, all the live events, you know you can post a live event, I got married today, I had a child or whatever, onto Facebook. So this is a resource. If you want to get, you can get one live event. You can uh, create by using this URL, URL, page ID is your page in which you are creating the, uh, the, um, the milestone or the life event slash milestones. This is, a col the, is the collection address, my page slash milestones. And they can post a new life event by providing these parameters, the ID, a title, a, a description, and the time. You cannot update, you cannot delete. You see the default information, create, update, delete, uh, and read. And also, uh, so you have all the, if you want the, the posts, for example, or statuses. An individual entry in a profile feed, you can read with a lot of information. You can publish a post by posting into the feed. So posts are the item and feed is the collection. The names change, but we can read them into the metrics that we saw before. And here, we also have, uh, also Facebook uh, provides, uh, uh, where is the, a tool for, for using this. Uh, well, there's instructions. Uh, let me get, no, it didn't load in the time. I try to reload it. Uh, while it's loading, Google Calendar. Uh, this is clear, it's also simpler as a documentation. Calendars are basically simple objects. Huh? You have this type of resources, calendars, events. You may have many calendars with events inside. For example, these are the two most important ones. 
In events, what I can have? The result interpretation of the events, I can delete an event with this syntax. Slash calendars, slash calendar ID, slash events, slash event ID. You see the relationships. You start by the list of your calendars, you select one, you start with a list, uh, with, well, you go in with a list of the events in that calendar, and then you identify one specific event ID, and then delete it. If you want to create a new event, uh, where is that? Uh, uh, post, insert. They call it insert. The, the syntax is post, calendars, the collection, one specific calendar, slash events, the collection of events inside. You can create an event by posting to this address, and posting what? Posting a request with a body that corresponds to this uh, resource representation. And this is an example of uh, an event. You need to send a message like this, it's only two pages, with all the possible details that a Google Calendar event may have. A tag, an ID, and uh, when, it, when, it, when it was created, when is the water data, the summary, which is the title, the description, which is the body, the long part, uh, and the location, uh, uh, who creates the, the organizer, start time, end time, and all the recurrence uh, stuff. Uh, and if you want to invite people, all the list of people that you need to invite, and so on. It's all one big, uh, it's a nested object, but if you create this, which is just a text document, and post it to the Google Calendar, if everything is fine, that uh, event is created. Okay, this is the interface, uh, the test interface uh, provided by Twitter, for example. So you see that you have, uh, it's, it's much uh, easier to read uh, than the documentation. And if you want to see tweets, uh, where are tweets? Uh, they were before, tweets. So I can send a new tweet here. And then will uh, allow me to fill the parameters and I will see the request and the response. Of course, for doing this, there's only one catch. For accessing all of these, uh, say, public interfaces, you need first to authenticate. So these APIs are public, but you need to be an authenticated user before you can accept. So if, if I try to, maybe not posting, but uh, reading my last uh, show. My, my tweets, and they try to send this get request. We see what happens here. Get statuses show, and then the parameters. And no, sorry, I didn't provide the ID parameter. The problem is that with this small resolution, Okay, uh, but okay. The, the problem is that it gave me a bad request because they were not, uh, it was not authenticated, but authentication data. So not everybody can query. You can query your, I can query your tweets because they are public, but I need to authenticate first as my user to, hmm, to check who is doing the request. But what you see is that the, for the request side, it was, it was sorry. Uh, a very simple get comment. Uh, in, the, in this case, uh, we can authenticate interactively on this console, and then later, so the, I'm giving to the console the permission of logging into Twitter with my credentials, and so in this case, uh, it should, uh, no. Where is that? Sorry. Query template. ID. Okay. Not all the status. I want the 
update not oh, ID show timelines uh, this one the user timeline gives me count uh, Twitter user trim user replies contribute to detail okay user ID these are let's try this okay so I asked for the latest tweet or for my timeline I don't know when I use that and what I got back is uh, a response from Twitter. And the response is a list uh, of uh, a number of tweets. Uh, and each of them has a set of parameters, which are, th this is the representation of the resource. The list uh, of items. In this case, in this method, I get these properties. Among these properties, we have an ID. It is the ID of the specific tweet. So we can use this ID in the other methods. When I can use the ID here, and get more, more information, I, I did something wrong, sorry. But for getting more information, about uh, that is a cut and paste error, uh, but uh, you, you get the ID there from, from the tweet there, and you put the resource name there, and you can get information about the resource. Huh? The the complex part, uh, the more comp most complex part here, is uh, doing the authentication, because you need uh, well interactively you just have a couple of clicks uh, with your application in uh, in Python or in JavaScript, when you create an application, you need to, to register your application on the website developer. So you, you must register a new Facebook app or a new Google API key or a new, for using the open authentication method, OAuth method. And there are libraries for using that in Python, but before that you need to go to every website and register uh, um, a key. So this is what uh, it's, uh, is, uh, is the, the first step, which is a bit intimidating because it has to do with strong, string, long strings of cryptographic text and so on. But after you do that, then it will be very easy to interact. So what people that when ask me, well, uh, can I, is it easy or not to accept that kind of information from that website? In 90% of the cases, if they are the big ones, uh, first, uh, it is easy, quite easy, and second, they all look the same. They all have a similar interface based on this criteria. HTTP, resources, get and post, basically. And so we can use this for accessing external websites. We can use this also for creating our own internal servers and to communicate with each other. You will see next week with the Philips bulbs, the colored lights, they, are, they can be controlled with the rest. The Philips uh, device, so you can do this on the cloud. Cloud services usually have a web, uh, REST interface, but also embedded devices, in many cases, they also have a REST interface. Okay. Um, well, we, are, we are just some, some example of guidelines, but uh, I wanted to spend the last five minutes uh, or 10 before the break. Uh, by giving you a bit more detail about this JSON format, which is the format of choice uh, in, uh, in REST, hmm? in the REST architectures. REST can work however you want, but the representation of objects, in many cases, is done in the, in the JSON format because it's very simple. Uh, JSON the name may stand for JavaScript object notation because it's a, it's a byproduct of the JavaScript syntax. We will see something about JavaScript next week. Um, 
and JavaScript as a syntax for initializing objects. JavaScript is a dynamic language, much like Python, in which you can create objects on the fly and add, uh, add the attributes to objects as you want. So there's, not, there's no fixed or static type for objects. So they had a, ve a very simple and nice syntax for initializing any kind of object. This means that a string of JavaScript may represent an object of some type. Um, and so they extract, they started to use this syntax to represent uh, information because it was easy. And also because uh, once, when the client of the REST service was a browser, the, the browser already has a, a JavaScript in, interpreter in it. So it would be very easy for the browser to read this data and convert them into objects. You just need to execute the JavaScript, to execute the string as it were a JavaScript code. So nothing uh, more. Hmm? So when you are trying to integrate different objects, sometimes the client uh, is a browser with some JavaScript and needs to get some information from a resource. So in that case, uh, it's already there. And uh, the syntax of JSON is actually very dumb, very similar, simple. It only has one data type, or well, two, number and string, and two constructors, two ways of putting together information. Dictionaries, collection, they call it collection of va name value pair. This corresponds to hash table, to structures, to Java objects, uh, to Python dictionaries, so all type of structures when you have a, a list of names and uh, some values associated to each name. So you think a Java object is like that. It's an object with some properties and properties are value. Usually you have the, the property, you have the getter method, you have the setter method, but all, of these, all that you have is an object with some names attached to it and some values attached to each name. A Python dictionary is always the same. You have a key that gives you a, back a value. A Nash table, when you created in, when you created a table in uh, the algorithms uh, courses, you had a key and you had a value associated with that. So everything, all this family of objects in which you have a list of symbolic keys, that might be numbers or strings, the only two types that we have, with associated data, they are represented with the braces. The other type of uh, object, constructor, is the list. List, linked list, uh, ordered list, uh, arrays, vectors, sequences, the, the, the various names of data type structures that are mapped into this simple square bracket syntax. So what it means is I can represent uh, a JSON like this. Brace means object or dictionary. Dictionary with keys, one, two, three, four keys. Or object with four properties. Or dictionary with four items. Use the language you want. They are all equivalent in JSON. An object with four properties. A dictionary with four items. And these four items are first name, the, the, the name of the properties are first name, last name, address, and phone numbers. And then column value, the value associated with the, this name, this value associated with this name, and so on. And uh, it happens that the value associated to the address is another object or dictionary. And this other object uh, is again represented as a list of properties, name, value, name, value, pair. And the value of these other property phone numbers is a list. The difference between lists and objects is that the items of an object have names, are indexed by their name. In lists, we only have a sequence of objects. They may be simple objects like these, they are strings. They may be other lists, 
they may be other objects, braces with, with parameters, but uh, the elements, each of the elements is indexed by their position, 0, 1, 2, 3, like in an array. While in an object, the elements are indexed by their name. It's the only difference. Whether the indexes are names or the indexes are, are positions. And in both cases, we have a list of values. And these values may be simple data, numbers, strings, other objects, other lists, recursively, as you want. The syntax of JSON is just here. It's all here. All you need to know. An object is brace, opening brace, name, column, value, repeated as many times as you want, closing brace. And the list is open bracket, square bracket, value, 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 without names here. The only difference. Closing bracket, uh, square bracket. And the value here and value there may be a string, may be a number, or may be an object. And so inside an object, we may have other objects. So inside an array, we may, we may be have objects, or maybe an array, or true and false or null. That's it. Everything else, all these big, strange pictures are just for the, the format of numbers and the format of strings, nothing that keeps us awake in the night. Okay, so every type of information can be represented in this way. And in Python, of course, we have uh, libraries for taking a Python object, a dictionary that contains objects and so on, and converting that to a string, to a document, in this, and reading it back from the JSON format into Python objects. So in most of the languages, we have libraries for doing this type of conversion, from native objects to JSON serialization. I mean serialization because at the end we have a string, a linear structure that can be transferred just as a string, and then the other, on the other side, we take the string, we deserialize it, rebuilding again real objects. And maybe on one side we have Java objects, and on the other side we reconstruct the Python objects. And so we accomplish the transfer of complex objects across different programming languages. Thanks to a very simple representation that runs on top of a very simple protocol, HTTP, with only four commands. It's only the simplicity of this stuff that allows us to scale to very big and, and to apply to any kind of, uh, of uh, cloud services and appliances and so on. So these are. The, the main principles. We will take some uh, classes, uh, starting from the next one, just after the break, uh, and then the next slides and so on, to build together pieces that all use, uh, first we start from the server, building sm small REST servers, then we will wor work with the clients uh, to build systems that are able to glue together using these principles. JSON, REST, HTTP. Break now, thank you. <laughs>